Good Welcome back to our series of lectures. Today we are going to be talking about pharaohs, temples, and tombs. Yesterday afternoon I gave you sort of a general overview of the history of Egypt and some of our hieroglyphs and things of that sort. Today we're going to focus specifically on where we're going to go tomorrow. Let me start out by saying congratulations on spending five days at sea. Uh, I know that these days get the longer we go, the longer they get, uh, but Tomorrow you start reaping the benefit of all this, and then we will have uh, today our talk, the next two days after we dock at Safaga early tomorrow, we will be overnight at Luxor, we'll be staying at the beautiful Luxor Hilton, and visiting the things I'm going to tell you about today, we then get back on the boat a day after tomorrow, and after, after the overnight we will travel overnight and arrive early the next morning at Sharm El Sheikh. And we'll either be going to St. Catherine's Monastery. I think there may be a few people who are uh, planning to go snorkeling or scuba diving. We get back on the boat that night and we go to Aqaba, Jordan, and we visit the fabled city of Petra. And then uh, back from that, all of these are, you know, the motoring overnight, and then we arrive early in the morning in each case. We will be going to Horgara in Egypt and have an opportunity, whether you're doing uh, tea with the Bedouins or some of the other activities. Uh, as you will recall, we've had to shorten some of those because we were told we have to arrive at the mouth of the Suez Canal early. Um, that, as, as I mentioned to you, I think earlier, the traffic in the Suez Canal only goes one direction. And so it all goes in convoy. And if you don't want to have to wait for another day or even two days, you have to show up when they tell you to be there. And so they've gotten the notification we have to be there a little earlier than we thought. We will transit the Suez Canal and then there will be four more talks uh, in the two days between the entry, uh, the exit from the Suez Canal, the entry into the Mediterranean, and the time we get to Athens. I especially want to congratulate you on sitting through, this is now starting the 13th hour of my lectures. <laughs> wow. And you're all just troopers. I was walking Tell through the that. veranda restaurant uh, yesterday or the day before, and um, a husband told his wife, don't ask him a question, he'll talk for hours. <laughs> I couldn't correct him on that one, so uh, I appreciate your patience. We are talking again. You've seen this image already. Most of these images are from where we're going to, or they originated there. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about the ancient city of Thebes, which is the modern name for it, is Luxor. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of this area, this city, and why it's important. Well then, I want to then tell you a little bit about the religion of ancient Egypt and some of the deities that they worshipped, because where we are going is, more than anything else, has been historically the, the primary center of some of the most important uh, religious functions and activities. We'll tell you all about that. And then I will get specifically into some of the sites that we're going to see. Um, I'm waiting, Rob, um, our voyage director, is email someone we're waiting to see up oh, there he is not yet don't have anything yet thank you Rob that's how he gets his exercises running back and forth to give me messages um, so I'll let you know as we go along he's finding out right now about one of the places that uh, I'm hoping we'll be able to visit but no guarantees yet all right the city of Luxor historically was known as the city of Thebes the Egyptian word for this place was Waset which means the city of the scepter after the Greek conquest, that is, uh, Alexander the Great and the Ptolemies, the general Ptolemy who came after, uh, they, con they translated the name and it turns out, as they translated and then transliterated the word, it came out as being Thebes. Well, it so happens there was a city in Greece named Thebes, and the city of Thebes in Greece, in order to keep the two straight, they referred to this place as the 100-gated city of Thebes, and the Thebes in Greece was the seven-gated city. So apparently it was a much smaller town. Um, if, so this has been one of the most important cities in the history of Egypt, and at one time it had a population of 80,000 people, which would have made it the largest city by population in the world at that time. It originally was uh, founded around 3200 BC, very early in the history of ancient Egypt. It began as a small town in the Old Kingdom, and then later on at the start of the Middle Kingdom, you remember I told you there's Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, New Kingdom, and in between they had intermediate periods. Well, when the, um, 
the king who defeated the Hyksos and started the Middle Kingdom, he's the one that really came to, to Thebes, ancient Thebes, and built it up, made it into the largest city by population in the world at that time. These um, sort of graphics here, this is Cairo, this is Giza, where the pyramids and the Sphinx are. Second, uh, second to the pyramids is Luxor, where we're going in terms of number of visitors. Um, the, you'll find, and this, this map over here, there, each side of the Nile had a very important significance to the ancient Egyptians. Because the sun rose in the east and set in the west, the east was understood as being the place of the living, and the west was understood as being the place of the dead. Now for the Egyptians, because they believed everyone's soul was eternal, that's why they did the mummification, they believed that there was going to be rebirth, that's why it was so important that they preserve the bodies and they preserve all the materials, the furniture, and, and all of the other things that somebody had to live with. Um, the, you'll notice when we get here that the east bank is where they had the temples. That's where the living happened. The west bank is where all the, funer uh, the funeral areas are. That's the necropolis, the Valley of the Kings, the Valley of the Queens, various other locations. So the idea is the sun comes up in the east and that's where the living are. When they die, they get buried on the west, on the west side of the Nile. And it had to do with the fact that for a very long time, Ra, the sun god, was the primary god of the polytheistic pantheon of the Egyptians. Later on, Ra got merged with another god, Amun, and became Amun-Ra. And where we're going, the primary temples here in modern Luxor, ancient Thebes, are the temples that were dedicated to Amun-Ra, the joint god Amun and the sun god Ra. In 1979, UNESCO named this area and the various uh, the, the Temple of Karnak, the, the huge temple Karnak, the Temple of Luxor, the Valley of the Kings, the Valley of the Queens, all of those together were named as a World Heritage Site. So what you are seeing are considered some of the primary sites in the world and second only to the Pyramids of Giza as a place that people visit here in uh, Egypt. Now, the city itself became very important in the, well, I don't want to do that yet, in the 11th dynasty, that is around 2000 BC, the city had already existed for about a thousand years then. So by the start of the Middle Kingdom, this city and the recognition of the god Amun, who soon became Amun-Ra, they joined the gods together, and it continued to be an important place of religious activity and worship for most of 2,000 years. In fact, you could argue that it has continued to be an important place up until the modern Christian time. Because later on, when Christianity came along, they, they turned some of these temples into places of worship. There are a couple of places we're going to be that there's, um, there still are indications that they have been used as monasteries, Christian monasteries, and Christian churches, like the Tomb of Luxor. And so to a very great extent, uh, up until today, the Tomb of Luxor has a mosque built on it. And so the mosque is still actively used. So for over 2,000 years, this place has been a place of worship. During the time of the Middle Kingdom, as they were building this area up, that's when Amun-Ra, the primary deity of the, the Pantheon, became the primary deity in all of Egypt. And he was called the King of the Gods. And I want to tell you a little bit about the religion, therefore, at this time. Egyptian religion, I described it earlier on when I talked about the uh, faith and culture in the ancient Near East, is a sophisticated polytheism. I call it that because they had very specific uh, visual perceptions of what their gods looked like. Many of them are human in form. Some of them are part human and part animal, like Anubis, who has the head of a jackal but the body of a human. Um, you'll, I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, in every case, though, it is a, it's a sophisticated polytheism because it was very well refined. It was refined because they spent 3,000 years adding definition to their understanding of the deities. All of the deities in Egypt have certain responsibilities. Ra was the god of the sun. He was responsible for the sun being there. I'm going to show you some of the deities and give you a description of them as we go along here. Um, one of the deities that you'll see in a number of the tombs, if you go there, is the, the goddess Nut, in a U-T, Nut. The goddess Nut, who's represented here, 
was the goddess of the sky. She is a human in form. She was the mother of the gods Osiris, Isis, Seth, and uh, Nephistus. And you will see her stretched out. Her, she's in the form of a woman, but she's stretched out with her arms on one end of the horizon and her legs on the other. It was believed that each night she ate the sun and each morning she gave birth to the sun. That's why the sun went away in the west and then came back in the east because the sky goddess, Nut, swallowed the sun and then gave birth to it again. They have a lot of other explanations as to what happens to the sun as it traverses through her, which was through the underworld as well. But she's one of the goddesses that you will see when you go on some of the tombs. If you look up, you will see the goddess Nut stretched across the roof of these tombs. We also have her father, Goddess Nut's father, was uh, called Shu. He was the god of the air. And you will sometimes see him holding her up because um, Shu was responsible for keeping the sky and the earth separate. The, another god that was very common was the god Geb. Geb was uh, the, whereas Shu was the mother of Isis and Osiris and Set and others, um, Geb was their father. He is the earth god. He was the god that was responsible for the earth. Uh, he wasn't all that popular, but they had him. They believed that earthquakes, when they occurred, were Geb's laughter. When he laughed, you get earthquakes. The most important of the gods, especially during this period and in where we're going, is the god Amun, who later becomes Amun-Ra, if you can see that. Uh, this is a little bit misleading. With it. They've given him a colored headdress here, but it actually is two parts, two plumes. I'm going to show you some other images. Amun was the chief deity of the uh, Theban, where we are going to be, of the Theban religious orientation. The New Kingdom especially, he was elevated as being the primary, the king of all the gods. Um, he was joined with Ra. His name, Amun, means the hidden one, the mysterious of form. And for that reason, Amun actually gets represented in a number of different ways. He sometimes looks like this, looks like a man with a double-plumed, uh, a tall, double-plumed uh, headdress. There are other times when he's represented by a ram, which is why you will see a lot of sphinxes, smaller sphinxes, with ram's heads. That was one of the other ways he appeared. Or sometimes as a goose as well. Um, Karnak, the temple of Karnak, I'm going to talk about in a little bit, was the primary temple to Amun. Luxor, the other temple we're going to be visiting, was a lesser temple, but the two of them were connected by a, an avenue of sphinxes. I'll show you some pictures. Later on, when the Greeks come in, and there's a lot of Greek influence, Alexander the Great, Ptolemy, etc., they connected. Um, you remember I talked about syncretism, how the Romans just took over the, the Greek gods, and you had the various gods that were aligned. Well, similarly, because Amun was the king of the gods, he was associated, when the Greeks arrived, with Zeus. And so they would talk about Zeus Amun. When Alexander the Great went out to Siwa, which was the oracle in the desert. The oracle was the oracle of Zeus Ammon, these two senior gods that had been linked together by the Greeks and by the Egyptians. The Greeks had always said that the Egyptians were the most religious people in the world, although they sort of made fun of their dog-headed gods, they, they said, one of the ancient historians said. But Zeus Ammon, Ammon-Ra, and you're going to see a lot of images of these tall headdresses. Another very important god in this time was Osiris. Osiris originally had been a vegetation god. He was thought to be the mythological first king of Egypt. Um, and one of the most important gods, Osiris later on becomes the focus of some of the mystery religions, along with his wife, Isis, who is represented here. These are sort of very modern representations, but they give you the image. It's believed that Osiris brought uh, civilization to mankind, to humanity. He was murdered by his brother Set. Set was the evil god. Most of the Egyptian gods were, they could be benevolent. In fact, most of them were assumed to be benevolent, but they could sometimes get upset and do bad things. Set, the brother of Osiris and Isis, Isis and Osiris were married, but they were also brother and sister. Um, Set was the god of the desert. He was the god of chaos, and everything he did was bad. One of the most important legends or stories in Egyptian, uh, the stories of the gods is that Set, who was the brother to Osiris and Isis, uh, tricked and killed Osiris. 
and then cut his body up and sent it all over Egypt. Well, Isis, his wife, Osiris' wife, gathered up all of the pieces from all over Egypt and put them all, all back together. There was only one part missing, which was a very important part to male gods, or men of any kind. And so Isis had to sort of use magic to give her husband, uh, Osiris, back his phallus. And then, once that she completed that through magic, uh, she conceived a child who is the god Horus, who's represented here. But anyway, Osiris, very important god, is represented as a mummy. He is always wrapped in white. His face is often blue, which is the, the symbol of death. Sometimes it's black, the symbol of earth, or green, the symbol of resurrection, because once Iris put him back, Isis put him back together, he came back to life, and he carries the two uh, symbols of kinghood, the, you know, the crook and the flail. And it's believed that he defeated, by coming back to life, he defeated his brother Set. But he, since he wasn't whole, he wasn't complete, he was missing a part, he was not allowed to reassume his responsibilities on Earth, and so he became the god of the underworld. Osiris is the god of the underworld, the god of mummification, and related to Anubis that we'll look at. And he's considered one of the most important, he's the judge of the dead. When people died, it was Osiris that sat in judgment for them. So you will see his image always, you know, sort of like this, like a mummy, but with these two symbols. He wears a tall white, um, the, the crown of Upper Egypt, the white crown with plumes of feathers on it. These are all things that you'll recognize even if you're looking at a, just a card stone image with no color. Isis all, uh, is often represented as having a throne on her head because for two reasons. She brought her husband back from the dead. She therefore was responsible for establishing the kingly throne and she had a son, Horus. Horus, who is the uh, hawk-headed god, sometimes he's represented as a hawk, sometimes as having the head of a hawk. He came back and fought against Set, defeated Set, and then Horus became the king. And he was the son. Sometimes you'll see images of uh, Isis nursing her baby son, Horus, before he turned in the, into the hawk-headed god. Isis is the giver of life. She's the healer, the protector of kings, and she, she brought her, um, her husband back together. She is seen as the ideal wife, the ideal mother. Later on, she was the source of mystery religions, and they saw her as representing slaves and the oppressed and the family and the children. That's why she was so well loved. Um, she, the, the worship of Isis spread all over the world. In fact, there was a temple to Isis in London. And so Isis was very, very popular. Horus, also popular, not nearly as, uh, as much. He was the god of sky and the protector of kings, as was his mother, because he defeated Set and reestablished the line. Another goddess that's very important is the goddess Mat. M-A-A-T. Mat actually was a principle that the Egyptians had. It's the principle of harmony and balance and truth and justice. And so they, they personified this idea of harmony and truth and justice, all of the good characters, in a goddess, Mat. She wears a, an ostrich feather on her head. Sometimes she's represented just by that ostrich feather. She was the goddess of the seasons, of the movement of the stars, of justice and ethics. Um, she, along with Osiris, is involved in being a judge in the afterlife. I'm going to show you an image from the Book of the Dead in a few minutes where you'll see some of these symbols. Another very popular goddess was the goddess Hathor. She was the daughter of Ra. You'll notice she is represented, there's three ways you see Hathor. Sometimes she's represented like this, a woman with a headdress that looks like a bull's horns. Since she's the daughter of Ra, it sometimes has the uh, solar disk in her horns. Other times she's represented just as a cow. Sometimes, and this is the funny one, you'll see the face of a woman with the ears of a cow sticking out on the sides. All of these are images of Hathor. She is um, the goddess of women, of love, of beauty, of music. Very, very popular. In fact, as I think I suggested to you when we talked about faith and culture, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, where they had been for 400 years, they got into the desert while Moses up, up on Mount Sinai, where you are going to be, the traditional site of Mount Sinai, um, the Israelites had Aaron make a god for them to worship out of gold, and that god was? 
You remember? Calf. Yeah. A calf. Yeah. I believe the reason that they probably had a calf is they had just come from Egypt, and Hathor, who's represented by a cow or calf, was one of the most popular gods at that time. Some of the other gods, very quickly, Hapi is a man, but he has breasts and a pot belly. He is the god of the inundation of the Nile. Because he has breasts, he's got a pot belly, he's got uh, water plants as a headdress because he represented the flooding of the Nile, which brought fertility and made them able to grow crops. Um, the breasts and the pot belly and all that is a sign of fertility. And so Hapi, even though he's a male god, is represented that way. Um, Anubis, the jackal-headed god, or sometimes just represented as a jackal, he conducted the dead into the underworld. He was the one that was involved along with Mott in judgment for the deceased. He is the god of mummification. I'll show you an image of a second. Anubis is always present when they're representing the process of mummifying. We then have Bastet, who is the goddess of cats. She's represented either by a cat-headed woman or by, um, a, just by a cat. She was the goddess of pleasure. And so you will see those represented. You also, another uh, god was Caffrey. Caffrey was the creator god, sometimes represented by a scarab, sometimes by a man with a scarab for a head. Ugly. But the reason why the scarab was so important, the scarab is actually the dung beetle. You remember your National Geographic uh, films and stuff? The dung beetle collects up dung and rolls it. Well, Catherine was thought to be one of the creator gods, and he rolled the sun across the sky the way a dung beetle rolls a ball of dung. The reason he was the creator god is because the Egyptians observed that out of this dung, these beetles would come out, and they thought they were sort of just creating themselves, that they were naturally occurring. They didn't know about planting eggs and all of that sort of stuff. So they thought of Capri as one of the creator gods. In addition to the gods, they also had demons in the mythology, in the religion of ancient Egypt. This is one of the ones that occurs most often. This is called Amut. He is the devourer of the dead. He had a head of a crocodile, the body of a lioness, and the legs of a hippopotamus. And an image I'm going to show you in just a second of the judgment of the dead. He's called the devourer of the dead. Now, demons were not as powerful as gods, but they were immortal. They're more powerful than people. He sat, Amut, this, this demon, would sit in the, uh, the hall of judgment, and if someone was found unworthy to enter the afterlife, he would eat their heart. That's why he's called the devourer of the dead. I'll show you that image. Not actually eating the heart, but... Uh, Here's an example that Anubis is always present at mummification. He is the god of mummification and in that regard of the afterlife. And this is the mummification of a pharaoh. Again, remember that being mummified was, uh, was because they believed in the afterlife and that you're going to need your body again at some point. And so they preserved it, as well as stocking all of these mortuary temples and these tombs with all of the furniture and the other things that they assumed these people would need when their spirit gets reunited with their body. That's a gross over oversimplification, but that's generally the idea. These are images from the Book of the Dead. The Book of the Dead was a guide to the deceased journey to the afterlife. This is actually a scene called the weighing of the heart ceremony. This is, a, this is a, an enlargement of this, so you can see it easier. You've got Osiris, remember the mummified god with the crook and the flail sitting over here. Behind him are his two sisters, one of them is his wife, Isis and Nephthys. They are supporting him. Here we have Thoth, who is the ibis-headed god, and Thoth is always writing. He was the god of, of the scribes, he was the god of wisdom. He took record of all of the events that are happening. Um, here you have Anubis holding the hand of the person being judged. The, the judgment that occurred after death, there were 43 deities that sat in judgment. The person who was being judged had to give what's called a negative confession. They had to say all the things they had not done bad. And then they would take the person's heart and they would put it on a scale and against the heart they would put, it's hard to see right here, it's the same image, the feather of Mott. You remember I told you she's represented by a feather? And that represents justice and wisdom and harmony and balance. If a person was really unrighteous, no matter what they said in their negative confession, if their heart was heavy with injustice or wrongdoing, 
and it was heavier and it ba outbalanced harmony and goodness and wisdom of the feather of Mott, then Amut, the demon, would devour their heart right there and they would not be allowed to enter into the afterlife. So this is what's going on. The thing about Egyptians, I mentioned to you when we were talking about Moses and all of that, the Egyptians considered writing so important that if something was written, it was real. If it was not written, it was not real. And the reason we have this very vivid kind of uh, drawing is they believed that if someone was wealthy enough to have a tomb, not just everybody got a major tomb. In fact, it wasn't in the Old Kingdom, only the pharaohs got this kind of treatment. Later on, they began to provide this for uh, wealthy or significant people in politics, in addition to, or noble people, in addition to the pharaohs. But they believed that if you could afford to have these images from the Book of the Dead painted on your tomb, you had a tomb, your own tomb, and this was there, then this was sufficient to make you righteous enough to get into the afterlife. So these kinds of images are, were painted in the tombs because just having them there would make you righteous enough not to have your heart devoured by the demon Amut. Okay? Um, very complex stuff. I want to now talk about the first place that we're going to visit, which is the great temple of Karnak, to tell you a little bit about this. Unless you have been there, you have no concept of what this is going to look like because um, this, the temple complex at Karnak covers a quarter of a million square meters, 250,000 square meters. The main temple of Amun, there's, there's four precincts or four temples. The, the, this, is, this area is dedicated to what's called the, the Theban Triad. There were three primary gods. Amun, or Amun-Ra, he was called later, was the primary one. His wife, Mut, and their son, Kansu. Well, all together, this, uh, just the main temple, and that's what this is, the main temple of uh, Amun-Ra covers 61 acres. And most of, I mean, you're going to see a lot of it. A lot of it is still there. Much of it, obviously, has is, is decayed over the millennia. Uh, you could take 10 average-sized cathedrals in Europe and just put them in the central court here. So, enormous area. In fact, this is the second largest ancient religious site in the world after Angkor Wat. Have you been to Angkor Wat? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear it. I got thumbs up from Rob, so now I can tell you about what we're going to see. Um, so this is really significant, and much of this, you will come in here, this is now a parking lot. It's not, it's not a water now, although this sacred lake is still there. You will come in through the main pylon areas, uh, through a courtyard and into the hypostal hall, these, these big areas, sort of big gates, are called pylons. Uh, this is what the layout looked like. There, as I say, there's four main sections to it. The precinct of Amun-Ra, there is the precinct down here of Mut, which was his consort, his wife, so to speak, and then the precinct of Mantu. Mantu was a popular god before Amun-Ra got so popular. Mantu was the warrior god. And he often was referred to like when Ramesses II fought in the Battle of Kadesh against the Hittites. You all saw a bad representation of that in the movie if you saw Exodus, Gods and Generals. But they said that Ra was, was roaring like the raging bull of Mantu. So he was the warrior god. But you've got all of these areas. There's a fourth area, which is just ruins now, had been the temple to Amun-Ra built by Amenhotep the, the fourth. Amenhotep the fourth is the one who decided these other gods are not going to be worshipped. He moved further uh, north down the Nile and built the temple complex at Amarna in order to worship the god Aten. He tried to convert all of Egypt to monotheism, to only worship Aten. Well, when he did, he had his temple here, which they still have the ruins of it, he had it destroyed because he didn't want to have a temple in his name built to the god Amun-Ra. He wanted to focus on a different god at that point. but. These all are connected. It's a large, large, large complex. This is the one that you can visit. The others are not available to visit. They're still doing active work there. But the precinct, as it's called, of Amun-Ra, you will enter from this direction through the main first pylon um, into the great forecourt. This is called the hypostal um, courtyard. I'll tell you about that, or hall. And then there is a uh, Thutmose the third built the primary sanctuary at the back where the god that was represented and it was a small golden idol which represented the god 
Every day the priest would go in there and would change the clothes, I think uh, several times a day, provide new food as an offering to this deity. And then every year as part of one of the most important month-long festivals, they would take the god out, put him on a boat, a bark, and would take him down to the other temple we're going to see, which is the Temple of Luxor. But there is a sacred lake. Uh, there actually are bleachers up here. That's where you'll sit in order to see the Sound and Light Show tomorrow night. That's just tomorrow. Um, so a lot going on here. This is, if you can see that, see the double-headed, uh, the double-plumed uh, headdress like this? This is Amun. And you will see that image in a lot of places. This is Amun-Ra. This representation, and this is actually from this temple, this is the representation of his wife or consort uh, Mut. This is his son, their son, Kansu. In fact, this is what Mut looks like. Mut wore the double headdress or the double crown, which represented both the white crown of Upper Egypt, and it, it's not as obvious here, but there is the red headdress of the Lower Egypt. This is their son, Kansu, who was the moon god. And so when you see him, he will have the disk of the moon over his head and then a crescent usually underneath that. Um, the moon, I'll just make a, a comment there, the moon was always important, has always in ancient religions, polytheistic religions, been important. In fact, in many religious cultures, the moon was more important as a deity than the sun. Can anybody imagine why that would have been the case? Why would they have focused on the moon often more than the sun even? What's that? Tides. Well, tides. For the most part, they didn't understand that. You can look at the moon, and you can't look at the sun. The fact that you could look at the moon, you could feel like this was a deity, you could, you could see features on the moon. Often in ancient cultures, they had more of a relationship with the moon because it was a friendlier kind of uh, heavenly uh, effect than the sun was. This over here is um, the Mantu, the warrior god. You'll notice, it's, it's interesting to me, he has the head of Horus, he's got the solar disk, and he's wearing the double-plumed headdress, which they later attributed to Amun-Ra. It's like he's got a little bit of everything. <laughs> he was not a primary focus later. Earlier on, he had been considered the god of the, the, the Thebans, or the god of Thebes. He got replaced, for the most part, by the other deities. This is a painting of what the first pylon of the temple of Karnak would have looked like. These and you can see, these are the people, those are the columns, those are the pylons. This is actually what the pylon looks like today. We don't have all of the brilliant colors, we don't have all of the illustrations, a lot of it's worn away, um, but you will still see a lot of the various kinds of carvings inside. This is the first pylon in, of Karnak. You walk through here, and our guides will take us into it, and you come to the hypostyle uh, hall, hypostyle hall. This is a person, this is the columns of the hypostyle. There are 134 columns in this hypostyle hall in 16 different rows. 122 of those columns are 10 meters high, around 30 feet. 12 of those are 21 meters, 80 feet tall. They're 33 feet around. Are you beginning to get an idea of the scope of this thing? And this stuff is all here. You will see carvings all over them. Um, the, this was built, the work on this, one of the things that's distinctive about the Karnak Temple is that they worked on it almost longer than any other religious site in the world. There were 30 different pharaohs who contributed to building to this. They would add a chapel or more columns or more, you know, carve more on it. There's a lot of raised relief um, throughout this. Ramses II, who, uh, in terms of politically and militarily, didn't do as much as people think, but he built more temples, and he added to more temples, and he put in more statues and things than anybody else. This, again, is what the Hypostyle Hall looks like. Remember, these, uh, these things here are from 30 to 80 feet tall. Uh, this is sort of an artistic representation of what it would have been like when they had, uh, there were outside walls and there were roofs. The roof is mostly caved in. This is what's called an architrave, which is a stone that sits on top of these. These, and you might, it's hard to see in this light, but you actually can get some color, especially underneath some of the roof pieces. You can see some of the color that would originally been there. These were brilliantly painted at one time. So now all you get is all of the relief work that's carved into it. There are not only hieroglyphics, 
but there are images of various kinds, particularly military images of victories that the various pharaohs won, etc. These arc trays are estimated to be 70 tons, and some of them are 80 feet in the air. We still don't know exactly how they did it. There's a couple of different theories. Some people believe that they might have used a very complex set of levers to very, very slowly inch these things up to set them on top because they were set on top after the columns were put in place. Some people believe, and we know because there's some evidence that you'll see on the inside of the first pylon at uh, Karnak, that they would build ramps and walls out of mud bricks and stones and they would build it and then they would slowly inch it up that angle and then they would get rid of all of the, you know, all of the uh, ramps that they had. But still, a 70 ton piece of stone taken from 30 to 80 feet in the air, you can just imagine what it meant for them to be able to do that kind of stuff. What's that? A lot of slaves. Yeah, and again, some, some Egyptologists, and I don't know if I told you that I'm not an Egyptologist, <laughs> some Egyptologists believe that they didn't actually use slaves, but that people dedicated their, when they weren't actually working in their own crops and stuff, they would work toward this. There's a big controversy about that. There is still a lot we don't know in other words. So this is the Temple of Karnak. You're going to like it. Okay. The second place we're going to visit is the Temple of Luxor, which is connected to the worship of Amun-Ra, but is not as large. The Temple of Luxor is connected by an avenue called the Avenue of Sphinxes, which is almost a mile and a half long. Now, they did not know this until they continued to excavate in between these two, and then they came to realize by digging up these sphinxes that there was a direct line avenue between the larger Karnak Temple uh, in the, or the precinct of Amun in the north, and then south of that, along the west bank of the Nile, uh, I'm sorry, east bank of the Nile, the Luxor Temple. These two were connected, and it's like one month a year, Amun-Ra, the image that represented Amun-Ra, would be taken to the southern temple, the Luxor Temple, for vacation. Um, <laughs> They would load them on a bark and they had this big festival and everybody loved it because there was partying and there was feasting and all sorts of things. Um, this, the, the southern temple, or the temple which now called the Temple of Luxor, that's the modern name for the town, but this is the Temple of Luxor. Its uh, Egyptian name was um, Ipet Reset, which means the South Sanctuary. Um, originally, it was built by earlier pharaohs. When you get there, a lot of what you're going to notice on the outside was built by Ramses II. Remember, he was responsible for more statues and temples and things than anybody. He mostly was spending money that his predecessors had gotten. This was built, um, the initial building of it was much later. It was about 1400 BC. But this is the place that has been used for worship up until today. Because they, before they had excavated all this stuff, they built a mosque. And then they started digging around and they find out, and still today you'll see, there is a mosque right in the middle of the Luxor Temple, which is still active today. They also used part of it for Christian worship at one point. This is a representation of what the Luxor Temple was. It's not as large, but still very impressive. They had a fortified uh, girdle wall that's called all the way around the outside, um, and various, various courts. Let me show you some more images. A lot of these are artist representations. The, the mosque, by the way, was built in the 13th century. It's still active in use. It's called the Mosque of Abu el Hagag. And when you get there, it's very obvious. You can see the minaret when you approach it. This is the main pylon, the main entrance. Now, originally, the Temple of Luxor started back here. And that was built by earlier pharaohs. Well, Ramses, who really liked things with his name and picture on them, he built this front part. And you will see some extraordinary relief images. The image I showed you the other day when we talked the other day, this was like six months ago, I think, uh, when the, about the Exodus, when the Israelites, when they saw what was chasing them, the Pharaoh in his chariot, that is right here on this wall, and it is an image of Ramesses. Um, this is the layout of the Luxor Temple. Again, when you come in here from the north, this says to Karnak, if you could read that. Let me sort of give you an outline of, of what's, what all is included in this. I start talking and outrun my notes. Um, this, starting here, there's a Sphinx Avenue, which goes almost a mile and a half up to the Karnak Temple. You come in, and this is just an open, open courtyard now, and it's not as obvious, but there was uh, a chapel here, a chapel of Serapis. Serapis was a god that was introduced by the Greeks in order to try to link together the Greek and the Egyptian worship. There was a chapel of Hathor, 
Out front, there are two obelisks, which again, I'll show you some images of, these enormous ob obelisks. Only one of them is there now. The other one is in Paris. It's on the Plaza de la, uh, de la Concorde. And of the obelisks that came from this area, there's now one in Paris, there's one in London, and there's one in New York. And I'm sure the Egyptians want them back, but they're not getting back right now. Um, as you came through here, this is the main pylon. The two obelisks were here. Uh, there were originally uh, eight, I'm sorry, six statues, enormous statues of Ramesses II that he put out. And right along this wall is where you see those engraved carvings of him in a chariot. There are only two of those now. Originally there were four standing statues of Ramesses and two seated ones. The seated ones are still there. As you come in, there is a peristyle hall and then a hypostyle hall, a colonnade. The, there is a chapel or shrine that Tutankhamun put in. There, Ramesses II built this, um, this peristyle hall. And then back here, you have the sun court of Amenhotep III, who was the father of Akhenaten, the guy that tried to change the worship. And as you go back, there's a shrine or temple room that was built or added on by Alexander the Great. Um, very historic kinds of stuff. This is what the front would have looked like originally. These are the two, uh, I mentioned obelisks, only one of them is there now. There were the two seated, um, and you'll, you'll see those, the seated Ramses, and then the four standing Ramses that are no longer there. One of them, I think, is there, but kind of broken up. And on the wall behind is where you can see the image of the Pharaoh in the chariot. This is what it looks like today. Um, so you still get the basic stuff, but only one of the uh, granite obelisks. These granite obelisks are 80 feet tall. They're made out of one piece of stone. The, one of the extraordinary engineering things the Egyptians were able to do is they mined these things, cut them out as one piece a, a considerable distance away. They would put them on sledges, drag them to the Nile, load them aboard specially designed boats, or barks as they call them, bring them here, and then the process is they would bring the whole, you know, put it back on the sled, bring it here, they would dig a hole, and slowly, using ropes and levers and everything, tilt the sledge up that it was on until it slid down into the hole. And then they would solidify it. Uh, again, doing that with a piece of granite that's 80 feet tall and doing that quite a few times, quite extraordinary. Um, this is one of the images that's inside of Ramesses II. Ramesses really liked his own image, and so he put a lot of them around. Um, this is another shot of one of the statues of Ramesses inside. This is what the interior courtyard that Ramesses put on would have looked like. Huge statues of him, enormous columns. This is a, an aerial view of the artist's representation, and you get an idea of the extraordinary color. By the way, these columns, some of them are designed to look like the lotus flower. Some of them are designed to look like the stalk of uh, the papyrus plant. You remember those were two of the symbols of the upper and lower Egypt. And so you see those symbols represented over and over and over again as a sign of the fact that this was the unified land. Here is another shot of what the outside would have looked like. They had, in addition to the pylons there, they had enormous um, poles for flags that they had out front. move forward here. This is what this same thing looks like today. With only one of the, uh, one of the um, major needles out front and then the pylon as you enter. Quite extraordinary. There, um, this is an image, an artist's image, of what it would have looked like as you were coming toward the front of the Luxor Temple, again the images, the C two seated and four standing images of Ramses, the obelisks here, the images are back here of Pharaoh. All along here, set that close together, were these, these sphinxes. Some of them had the ram head, which remember that's one of the symbols that Amun-Ra uh, was thought to be represented by. Some of them have these sort of human heads. They would have been painted at one time. This is what they look like today. And they're uncovering more of these. What happened is when they discovered that this avenue of the Sphinxes was over a mile, about a mile and a half long connecting the two temples, they ended up saying, we need to uncover this. Well, there were a lot of businesses and stores and a Presbyterian church <laughs> along the way. And so the government of uh, Egypt has been buying these properties and helping, in some cases, helping people relocate 
elsewhere. And they're in the process of uncovering all of this and putting this avenue back in place. Eventually, you'll be able to, to I, I assume, you'll be able to walk along this avenue that stretches between the larger Temple of Karnak in the north and the, the smaller but still very significant Temple of Luxor in the south. Again, this is what these sphinxes would have looked like originally. Some of the ones, the sphinxes that you'll see at Karnak do have the ram's heads. But that's what you'll see today. The next thing I want to tell you about, and this is why I was waiting for a thumbs up from Rob, because he did not know if we were going to be able to visit here. One of the most interesting characters of the New Kingdom was a woman pharaoh named Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut um, did a lot of things. She was a very significant woman, and the guys will be telling her about her, uh, telling you about her. She was pharaoh for about 15 years. What happened was her father, her grandfather was Amos the first, who started the New Kingdom. He died and his, left a son, but his son died when he only had the only surviving grandson or grand, grandchild of Amos the first, the starter of the New Kingdom dynasties, was Hatshepsut, a woman. Well, the, there was a son from a non-royal uh, wife, and that son was married to Hatshepsut, so she was the one with royal blood. But the, uh, she married, she had a stepson who became Thutmose III, but when the, her father died, Thutmose III was not old enough to take the throne. So they made Hatshepsut, who was the daughter of royalty, made her the regent. In other words, she was in charge until her son got old, old enough. Well, she was not happy just sort of sitting on the throne until he got old enough. So during the 15 years she was there, she declared herself pharaoh. And she often would represent herself with the symbols of Pharaoh, including the beard, which was a symbol of the Pharaoh. She didn't try to pretend she was a man. Everybody knew she was a woman. But um, she, all of these are images of Hatshepsut. This is the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut that we're going to visit. That's what I was waiting for Rob to tell me. Um, a mortuary temple, the, the Egyptian name for it is translated as the mansions of millions of years cool name, mansions of millions of years. The idea was this was a mortuary temple which was a, a symbol both of worship and of eternal life for the person that built them. And she has the one that is most extraordinary. To give you an idea, this was built a thousand years before the Parthenon. Okay? <laughs> Just to give you a perspective. We're going to be visiting here. You'll be able to walk up this these steps and ramp up here. You'll uh, most of these columns are images of her. But if you go inside, so there, there are images back in here. You'll also see images especially of Hathor, the, the face of a woman with the ears of a, of a cow. She was very good leader. She, she expanded their, their uh, trade down into the south. In fact, they have images there of great trading missions that she commissioned down to Punt, or in Nubia, as, as it was known later. Um, in fact, out front, you can't see it here, but down, down along the front, at one point they claimed that there were tre the trees that were planted along there were from the original plants that they brought from Punt during her reign. Well, she reigned for 15 years, was co-regent with her stepson and nephew, got very complicated, you know, they were marrying for the sake of the, of the rule, uh, Thutmose III, Thutmose III, she sort of shipped him off to be in charge of the military, and when he got old enough for that, when she still wanted to be in charge, eventually she dies, he takes over as king, he became one of the most important kings, I believe he was the king of the, the uh, Hebrew uh, exodus, Thutmose III, because the dates line up. Well, he ended up being one of the most significant, he expanded the Egyptian territory as far north as northern Syria, over into Libya, further south into Nubia. It was the wealth that he, first Hatshepsut, his stepmother and aunt, and then Thutmose III, what they gathered, it was all of that money is what Ramses II was spending when he was building all of this stuff. And Ramses II sort of overspent, overextended, did not do a whole lot to build it up. And Ramses III, the son of Ramses II, was the last of the great pharaohs. It went up to Ramses the Ninth, but after the third, there really wasn't much going on. These were this was the most significant period in the entire of the New Kingdom and perhaps in all of the history of 
uh, the Egyptian people. So we are going to visit there. These, by the way, are hieroglyphs for her names. There's two ways that it's represented. Uh, and you'll notice that it has the loop around it and the, the bar at one end. We are going to visit this. And I, we weren't sure about that. That's what we were waiting on the email to confirm it. So we will have a chance to go there. Um, the last place that we are going to visit, I mean, we, we also are going to have the great, great good fortune um, day after tomorrow. Before we come back to the bus, uh, get on the bus and go back to the ship, we are going to have lunch on a um, one of the small sailing boats. They have enough of them for all of us. And they have like a five course meal sailing up and down the Nile. Okay, great stuff. Um, you'll be able to brag to, it, to your friends and family. This is the last place we will visit that's of archeological significance, which is the Valley of the Kings. Um, there was a Valley of the Kings where in the New Kingdom, particularly the 18th and 19th dynasties, the various kings had figured out, as I said before, that if you build these giant pyramids, these giant very showy tombs, you're just inviting somebody to come and rob it. Because they put all of the gold and the, all of the things that they needed or wanted to have in the afterlife were stored in their burial places. So they created a Valley of the Kings, and there's two, two arms of the valley here, uh, the East and West Valley, in which there are 63 different tombs that have been found so far. The most recent one they found in, I think, 2008. There are tombs that are just one chamber. There's one tomb that's 120 different chambers. And when you go into the visitor center here at the Valley of the Kings, they have this big plexiglass, like cube, so you can see through it. And in it, they have some of the more complex chambers. Some of them go straight down and then out. They've got arms that go off. And so make sure you spend a few minutes looking at that because you can see exactly how complex the, the, uh, some of these tombs are, how far down they go and how many chambers there are in them. Um, this is a map. They have mapped all 63 of the ones that exist. As I say, the re most recent one was only found a few years ago. And they believe that they may find more. Uh, Typically, when, we, when you go there, they'll allow us to visit the tomb of Tutankhamun, although, as I said the other day, there's not a lot in there now. All the good stuff they took out, and it's, you know, somewhere en route. You know, you, some of you, how many of you have seen the treasures of Tutankhamun? Right, because they travel around with it. Um, so, when you go into the tomb of Tutankhamun and you climb down the steps, the reason that it was not robbed is because it was actually, Tutankhamun uh, was not Pharaoh for very long. He was not very significant. But by the way, you'll notice his name, Tut Ankh Amun. Amun, the god that they were worshiping. Tutankhamun was young. He didn't serve for very long. He was not very important. So when he died, he was a pharaoh and he needed to be buried. But they dug a burial tomb for him underneath another tomb. And so that's why they didn't find it. And they did it in a hurry. And it was like, like your grandma's attic. They shoved all this stuff in there. It was not organized. It was just like, okay, he's a pharaoh. We got to do we got to do this stuff, but let, let's get it done quick so we can go on about the other things. So all of this stuff was just crammed in there. There's two main chambers and then two sort of small closet kind of areas that they found stuff in. But when you go into the tomb, you go into one chamber and over on one side, unless unless you know, unless he's gone to Dubai for a while, there's two dumb commons, mummy, and they got him just covered in a blanket. There's not even a note on it. There's no sign that says, this is the guy. But, you know, you'll see his face, you see his toes, he's right there. And then over on the right-hand side, it's blocked off, but you can lean over, and they do have some paintings on the walls of the second chamber. It's not that fancy, but you can say you've been in the tomb of Tutankhamun, and you saw it. You then will be able to pick which of the other three tombs you want to visit. Your ticket will allow you to go in Tutankhamun's tomb and three others. And you can decide which one you want to go to. Not all of them are open all the time because they're continuing to do work in them, but you can pick. Do you want to see that if it's open, the tomb of Ramses II, or Thutmose the Third, or various other of the pharaohs that were buried here? Um, and this is you know, what they look like. Some of them are much more simple, some of them very ornate. Some of the art in them is very simple. Some of them is just extraordinary. The colors, the imagery, etc. So quite extraordinary. Um, this is the opportunity of a lifetime to see this stuff. Um, I, the fact that we're able to see it a second time is especially valuable to us. Any questions about any of that? The religion, Luxor, ancient Thebes, or what we're going to see? Yes? Are there descriptions of the, of the three tombs that we can visit before you go? I mean, how do you make a choice? Haphazardly or...? Well, when you get there, there are signposts. You know, like as you're walking up, there are various sort of uh, 
things that go off of this, and there are signs that say, this way to the tomb of Ramses the Ninth or whatever, your guides will make some recommendations. Okay. They will tell you the most spectacular ones that are open right now that you can go see are Ramses the Ninth, Ramses the Second, Tutmos the Third, etc. So ask your guides, and they will give you an indication of what they think, because they know all of these really well. So they'll help you in that choice. Otherwise, you sort of, you know, walk into the openings of these, and some of them you walk quite a ways back, and they may or may not be that impressive. And since you only get to visit three, it's a good idea to ask your guides which ones they would recommend of the ones that are open right now. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Yes? Photo policies. Photo policies. You're not allowed, as I understand it, you're not allowed to use flash in the tombs. It, I mean, if you've got a steady hand, they're lit about like, uh, you know, what I showed you there. Some of them more than others. So, um, you're not allowed to use a tripod, you're not allowed to use a flash. Other than that, I think you're allowed to take photos. Um, I could be wrong about that, and the reason I say that, uh, Rob? No, oh, he's, that's not Rob, that's Greg. Um, the, um, Rob will let us know, and we can ask the guides. We were surprised, the, the, what we had been told was the policy, they've either changed it or it's, it's incorrectly represented in the website on some of the places we're going to be. So we'll have to let you know about that. When I when we were there, I believe we were allowed to take photographs, but not with flash and no tripods or anything like that. The tripod thing is for safety, because people trip over it. But we'll let you know as we go along what the, what the policy is on that now. I think we got something in our rooms, but I don't even remember what yeah, it said. Yeah, we did. It just okay. said that there are restrictions. Yeah. All right, any other questions about any of this? Did I see a hand over here? Okay. Um, I'm looking forward to this, and I've been here before. I think you should really look forward to it. The instructions tonight at 645, Rob will be in here. You've gotten information already in baggage tags at, in your rooms because they will collect the bags tonight after you go to bed. They will put the bags on the buses. They'll take care of all that. We'll have guides with us that will meet us at the boat when we get off. And so on the buses, they'll be available. They'll be talking about some of this stuff and giving you directions. They know a lot more about this than I do. So you'll learn a lot more from them. But uh, this is an extraordinary opportunity. Thank you. You get five whole days of not having to listen to me. And then we'll pick it back up after that. Thank you.